work in progress. So hopefully you'll be able to benefit from this discussion. Let me give some background to um, yeah, what we're doing here. My name is Joey. I'm a British Academy Postdoctoral Fellowship at SOAS. Just started this year. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting to be able to uh, set up this series of webinars. And it's been really encouraging to see how many people have been excited to, to get involved in learning different aspects of linguists and people from all over the world, people from all kinds of backgrounds as well. So it's great that this first one gets to be Vijay, who happens to be not just a linguistic colleague, but also a friend of mine who I've known for quite a few years. Uh, we met, we were both uh, started our uh, research at Oxford several years ago. And at that point, uh, Vijay was doing his master's on Huru Silaka, but his actual work with this language community dates back to 1999, when he first moved to the community in his role uh, with uh, Jesuits. He was involved in education there for a long time, learned the language, and decided to get involved in collaborating with the community to help support an effort to create orthography and literacy in the language. Uh, and that's what led to his interest in uh, studying more of the language from a linguistic aspect, first focusing on the phonology of the language, which is very complex. And now currently he's uh, near completion of his PhD or his DPhil at Oxford, for which he got a ELDP grant from Endangered Languages Documentation Program to do a large documentation project. Um, so we'll hear about parts of that project today. Um, I should mention that you know the focus of his dissertation is actually not on this topic. This is uh, something that he's developing now in addition to his dissertation work. Uh, he's focused on the grammar and the dissertation. I've been able to look at parts of that, and that's going to be really interesting for anyone interested in uh, the syntax and morphology of languages in this part of the country. So Vijay is going to be submitting his dissertation about a month from now, and it's been a very stressful year so far. So we're really grateful that he took the time to do this in addition to, to the research that he's focusing on mainly for his dissertation. Um, uh, so that dissertation should be out sometime next year for those who will be interested in the grammar and syntax. But today we're going to focus more on Vijay's documentation project that he did with the Hurusuraka community uh, starting back in 2015 or 2016. That's still ongoing as the community continues to, to work on documenting their own language. So he'll share bits of that, but also reflect on sort of the impact uh, that that's had and the questions that's, that that project has sort of brought to the surface about uh, the language and the identity in this uh, community. So let me see if I can unmute you, Vijay. Oh, oops, I just mute and reboot, sorry. Okay, Hello. unmuted. Great, sounds good. Uh, so with that, um, let me just say the other thing is that uh, Vijay will talk for about 40 minutes or so through the presentation. Since we're such a large group, uh, we'll just ask for questions to be written into the chat. So feel free to write your questions in the chat anytime if you have questions. And then at the end with whatever time we have left in this hour together, I'll try to sort through and get to as many of your questions in the chat as possible for Vijay to respond. So without further ado, Vijay, why don't you go ahead and share with us what you have to share. Thanks, Joey. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good, <coughs> good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, a very special welcome to all the members of the USO community who uh, are here. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to uh, just say a, f a few words of welcome in their own language. Um, hey, no tru tru adam je ni tru adam je fudu fu yo zgdo voso we ni du ni yo hogdo voso we ke no he tu me i he me i would like to screen my share uh, uh, share my screen and then uh, can you see my screen not yet hello just a minute Joy, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, nope, not yet. Not yet. Just a minute. Sorry. Yeah. 
Sorry for that. Great. The topic of uh, webinar today is ORCID, our sister identities, relationality and language documentation. Um, this is the outline of today's talk. Uh, I will be talking first of all about language endangerment and then uh, I will go on to the today's topic proper identity, identities and relationality and I will explain this theme with the uh, two stories from the Usawaka community, where, uh, we, the stories that we reflected on uh, me and my collaborators when we were documenting the language and then part three uh, I would speak about I would like to speak about collaborative uh, language documentation among the Oswaka community. Uh, first of all uh, I'd li like to begin with this question how many languages are there in the world? Many of you my linguistics colleagues will know this but just to reflect upon this question um, there are uh, 700, uh, 7,111 languages as of 2019. Uh, this is the big picture. 80% um, of the languages, 80% uh, of people speak only 94 languages. That is only 1.34% of the languages. Whereas 98 almost 99% uh, of the languages are speak, uh, spoken by only 20% of the people. Um, so almost half the languages of the world have less than 10,000 speakers and almost 2,500 languages are endangered. 360 languages have gone extinct since 1950 and every year six languages are disappearing. So we may ask, so what, why should we care? There are people who say that we need not care. This is a natural process of evolution. Languages die and, they are, and new languages are born. So those languages that die, let them die. Uh, people like Keenan Malik, who is a popular columnist, uh, a British author says, um, speaking a language such as English, French, or Spanish, and discarding traditional habits can open up new words, worlds, and it's often a ticket to modernity. And uh, Malik continues, most languages are die, languages die out not because they are suppressed, but native speakers themselves choose to kill their own languages for uh, for better life, and therefore it's okay if the languages die. Um, Reflecting this same attitude, a young Uso Aka father one day uh, back in 1999 told me, what's the use of teaching a language to my son? It won't earn him his daily bread. He was going to teach his children Hindi and he was puzzled why I was, uh, I was actually uh, learning his language uh, when he, he himself was giving it up. So Malik, continues and says, what if half the world's languages are on the verge of extinction? Let them die in peace. Um, some of the answers to this question, why bother? I will, I will be dwelling on this question throughout this webinar, but uh, from current researchers and scholars, we know that loss of language is a loss of humanity. It's a knowledge system a complete system in itself and every time we lose a language we lose some some of that uh, they are also repositories of cultural ecological and historical and medical and geographical knowledge uh, we all know this and uh, linguistically speaking they tell us how language itself works therefore each language gives uh, insights into human language in general but this position has been criticized uh, as romanticizing uh, indigenous languages. It's an outsider's obsession, obsession. whereas uh, when the community itself doesn't want to preserve their language, why should we care, outsiders? Um, and this, is being, this has been criticized as purely a utilitarian uh, view. Just because languages are useful to us, therefore we must preserve this language, not very convincing. Uh, there are deeper reasons. 
language, culture, and ecology depend uh, on each other. For example, um, linguistic and biologically uh, biological diversity uh, are interconnected. For example, in, uh, wherever there is uh, biological diversity, there is also linguistic diversity. Uh, there is a lot of research going on right now in this area, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's in early stages. So dominant languages, act, from the uh, social justice point of view, uh, when the dominant language is imposed upon a minority a commun a language community, it, it becomes a tool of exclusion because only a few privileged will rise and everybody else will be suppressed. Uh, this creates language induced poverty. This is relatively a, uh, a new uh, concept and a lot more ne research needs to be done in this area. Um, and basically language rights as a social justice issue. Uh, there are also psychological, emotional and cultural reasons. Um, for example, one, one important thing is uh, people in a culture lose a sense of place, purpose, and a path when they lose their language because their language is a repository of their own uh, history and their local knowledge. Therefore, strong words have been used to describe this phenomenon as linguicide and linguistic genocide. There is also some indication that language loss leads to uh, mental health damage. Um, when we had a recent uh, a seminar on orthography in 2017, a young Uso Aka leader stood up and uh, told us publicly this. My parents gave me the best education, but I bear the shame of not knowing my language. So it creates this kind of pain and regret in people, those who do not speak their own uh, language. So language loss is an abrupt uprooting from the past. It causes trauma and destroys meaning system and leaves a void, especially for indigenous communities. So to summarize this, I would like to say, state that minority language speakers actually do not choose to give up their language because it is a very painful choice uh, and they are pressurized, uh, pressured into making uh, that choice. Coming to various responses to endangerment, one attitude is, okay, let them die in peace as Malik said, but there are other options. Uh, there is uh, the possibility of documentation, language description and community mobilization. And uh, today I would like to speak about uh, each of these aspects of response to endangerment. In this section, I would like to give a little bit of introduction to Uso people and uh, uh, their land and their language. Northeast India, where Uso people live, is a language, a, a linguistic diversity hotspot. You can see in that red circle how many languages are concentrated in that small area in India. Uh, this is the state of Arunachal Pradesh, and in that state, also, people live in the West Kamang district in this area in three administrative circles called Trijino, Buragaon, Jamiri, and uh, Balupong. These are some of the uh, photographs of our people in their traditional dress. In historical records, um, also Akas first appear in the early British records in, uh, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, they were known for trading uh, relationship with the Assam and the neighboring indigenous tribes. And when uh, those relationship, relationships got, uh, uh, didn't go well, they were in the habit of repeated raids and therefore they came into conflicts with uh, the Br British colonial structure. 
uh, they had the rights to collect certain amount of taxes for perhaps for helping the local chieftains in warfare. Um, but when the British took over, they uh, disallowed that and that led to con conflict. And their most famous um, historical figure is Thagi Raja uh, in Uso Thagze. He repeatedly uh, rebelled against the British and conducted raids in the plains. He was imprisoned in 1829 and in 1832 he was released and from there he raided Badipara and there was a massacre of uh, 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 British outs, outpost and then he was outlawed. Finally there was a peace and then uh, in 1873 uh, Thage Raja died. The Uso people have had amicable relationship with the relationship with the uh, Plains people and uh, with the Indian government ever since. As for, as for the oral history, each clan has its own oral history. Uh, for example, the Buragao uh, clans, uh, where I did my field work, these clans claim that they migrated from Assam. I, uh, since this is, this talk is about linguistics and language. I do not have time to go into all the details. Um, th this is the Buragao or Hulubro village, also people call this Hulubro. And these are some of the fields. As you can see, uh, people practice slash and burn cultivation. They depend on the uh, forests around them for their sustenance. And then uh, among the forest, the, the villages are situated in the forest and then the fields are also in the forest. Uh, they clear a small pot and then cultivate uh, this way. This is the traditional dance. So also Aka traditional dress, Labi uh, so the vice president of the community. And in this photo, we have four generations of Uso Akas uh, in one, uh, one photo. You can see the little one there behind the grandmother. This video is uh, a small glimpse of the village life. Just a small introduction to the language itself. Uh, there are between three to four thousand speakers of Usuaka today. It's a there is a rapid language shift to Hindi, and uh, it's uh, it's definitely threatened and uh, classified as a six B language on aged scale. It is uh, Van Dream says it's endangered with imminent extinction within a generation or two. Uh, there are questions about its affiliation. I would, I would not like to make any definitive statement about uh, this. I uh, have a feeling that it's definitely a, a Tibeto-Burman language, but research is still going on be uh, because of its very uh, unique nature where, uh, I will come to that a, late, a little later, it's difficult to determine its uh, affiliation still. Is definitely different from neighboring languages and uh, its, its fricative phonology has been noted since the early 20th century. Um, I would like to demonstrate some of those sounds. Uh, Harrison says it's a fabulously complex language with uh, wicked tongue twisters. Khusajwa. Chuka. Chuka. 
Kıçkın. We hear that these words kıçkın or tuka. You can uh, hear the vowels are always, you know, almost whispered. So this uh, language has lots of uh, consonant uh, clustered uh, clusters and also in between there are whispered vowels, de-voiced vowels. That's why it uh, sounds uh, as it does. Kıçkın, for example. Uh, this is a tongue twister for you. Uh, this goes like this. And uh, this is the phonemic transcription of it. And then this is the phonetic transcription. Uh, this is a made up sentence and it means this. I come to the part two of this webinar presentation. We the Russo. How do Russo people see themselves? Um, I feel very humbled and honored to speak about this topic on behalf of the community. And this definitely is uh, not my work alone. It is, uh, these insights have been gathered from the collaborative field work that I have been doing with the community members. So uh, the stories and the reflections belong to them as well as uh, uh, me. So I'd like to define three terms here. Uh, first of all, identity is a, uh, anthropologically speaking, there's a lot of debate about this term, but I, I would like to take this very simple definition. Identity is who we are in relation to others, socially, culturally, and biologically. And as a linguist, I can't help thinking in terms of contrast. And I would like to also highlight this aspect, who we are in contrast with others, what is, unique about us and what sets us apart from others. This is the question of identity. Relationality is the web of relationships that connects humans, spirits, plants, animals, and other entities in the uh, cosmos. And language documentation, I take uh, Himmelman's definition. Uh, those who are familiar with language documentation are familiar with the, this uh, definition. It's concerned with methods, tools, and theoretical theoretical underpinnings for compiling a representative and lasting multipurpose record of a natural language or one of its varieties. I will explain this definition as we go, go along. Um, also, Akas have a strange custom. And I would like to speak to you about uh, this custom. That is when a, a child is born, they immediately uh, call out a name. The belief being, if you do not call a name, uh, if, you, if you do not give it a name first, then the spirits will give it a name and claim the child as uh, their own. So therefore, uh, you must give a name to the uh, child as soon as it is, is born. But that's, that's, that's not, uh, not the most interesting part. The interesting part is this. Once the name is given, then a child must choose its own name. Uh, this sounds very strange, but it's true. Um, on the fourth day or, or any appointed day, the parents and the relatives will come around the child. And uh, uh, since the name that is given as soon as the child is born is given by someone else, now it's the child's responsibility and then privilege to choose its own name. So they utter different names. The child obviously cannot speak. Uh, and they, they give a coin or uh, uh, some other materials. Uh, different people use different materials for this. Nowadays, they use coins or uh, currency notes uh, and put it in the hands of the child. If the child um, holds whatever is given, whatever his name is uttered and as soon as the name is uttered, if the child holds that uh, currency note or a coin, then the name sticks. That means the child has chosen its name. If not, the child has rejected the name. So this process can go on and on. And uh, uh, my uh, friend Labi the other day told me his uh, child naming ceremony was uh, uh, quite a tedious one. It, it, it almost dragged on for a month because the child was not accepting any uh, name that was given to it. So uh, this may look uh, strange, uh, but there is a reason behind it. And the reason can be uh, discovered by analyzing this story. So I'd like to 
uh, share this story with you. The story is titled Section the Spirit, His Clever Daughter and the Dumb Son-in-Law. So once upon a time, there was uh, uh, this human being and this spirit. And the spirit gave his daughter in marriage to the uh, human being. His uh, name was Homo Tuvulevo. And uh, then the spirit uh, started regretting, what have I done? I have given my daughter in marriage to this man. So I must get my daughter back. And I must also uh, get the man's land uh, for myself. And therefore, he goes to the man and uh, um, uh, tr tries to uh, trick him into various competitions. And he says, okay, let's have a competition. And if I win, my land belongs to you. If you win, your land belongs to me. And the spirit thinks, since I'm, I am more powerful than him, uh, I will definitely win. The daughter uh, knows about this. And then she advises the husband. And every time there's a competition held, the uh, husband wins. And finally, the spirit gets exasperated. And he says, okay, let's go fishing. Uh, this, this competition is not working, so let's go fishing. And they go uh, fishing, and uh, there he tries to trick him again. All right, the, the, the water is too shiny. Let's remove our eyelashes and keep it on a stone here. And the spirit pretends as if it's uh, taking out its eyelashes. And then uh, man also does the same. And he sends the man downstream. Okay, you go down. Uh, downstream and you fish there i will uh, fish here as soon as the uh, man goes uh, down uh, downstream he eats up the eyelashes and uh, uh, the human being uh, gets very sick uh, this is interesting because in uso aka worldview um, if you lose your bodily integrity uh, you uh, for, you are bound to become uh, sick um, then there is a whole uh, commotion and uh, finally, the daughter goes to her father and uh, requests him, uh, do not trouble my husband, I love him. Uh, therefore, you need to uh, give his health back. Um, and the spirit uses this opportunity to teach his daughter and uh, a human being. You can see how, how ambiguous this uh, whole nature of the spirit is. Uh, the spirit teaches the human being um, about domestic animals and uh, the, uh, the the wild animals about the sacrifices what part of this uh, sacrificial animal should be given to the priest um, and what is to be distributed among the villages what uh, part could be kept by human being etc and what are the plants that could be used for uh, uh, sacrifices uh, you know, making the sacrificial altar etc and from that day this whole um, uh, ceremonies and uh, um, rituals came into being. Uh, what do we learn from this story? What do we gather from this story? I'd like to uh, share the screen again. Uh, so the, the st story doesn't state about the whole cosmology of uh, the Oso Akas, but this is how, uh, this is what we can gather. Uh, first of all, Osuaka worldview sees uh, the entire cosmos as being divided into different realms. So there is uh, Shapum Nolu, for example, the spirit realm. There is Netro and Netru and uh, the earth, No, and Sujibro Nolu, where human beings dwell. Kudapuda, the dwell, realm of the mountains and wat water and mountains. Sambia, the forest. Nezu, the sky, where uh, realm of the cursed souls. Chikjenefs, the realm of the dead. Uh, and there is uh, interaction between different beings um, of different realms. And uh, the whole cosmic balance exists because of this uh, interaction. And just like there was imbalance and then there was suffering when the spirit tries to, uh, tried to grab ma the man's land. Um, so when, whenever this balance is disturbed, and there is chaos. And there is also the inner circle of the self. Um, and around the self, there is Netro, husband, wife, uh, children, and domestic animals. And there's Netro, the village, clan, and the fields, etc. Uh, so back to the naming ceremony. 
so I asked the question, why is this, uh, this may look a strange ceremony, but uh, this goes back to that story because this is based on a concept of the realms and beings. Um, the human being, any human child must be claimed by a community as its own by giving a name and then it becomes fully human. So therefore, I belong, therefore I am. This is the basis of human identity in Uso Aka. If you do not belong, if you do not have a clan, if you do not have a family, if you do not have a village, if you do not have a land, you have no identity. Uh, then again, a child must use, uh, must choose its own name. Um, and uh, the child, for example, even when the child is born, it is seen as a free human agent. Uh, therefore, it has freedom to choose its own name. Then once it chooses its name, it can, cannot blame anyone else. I've seen uh, people, you know, when children complain, uh, when children complain, why did you give me this name? <laughs> Parents are smiling and say, you chose that name, uh, this kind of thing. So Usuakas are very independent people, very democratic, and uh, they value freedom and responsibility greatly. The second story is Orchid, our sister. There were, I, I will, I'm running short of time. I will briefly narrate this story. There were two sisters and an elder brother and the, uh, the elder brother had a wife. One day the elder brother had to uh, go to the plains of Assam and the sister-in-law started persecuting uh, the two sisters and there was terrible domestic abuse, and finally she uh, kills the two uh, sisters. It's a very tragic story, uh, but the two sisters who, who were killed, they bec become orchids. One is called the Chicho, the other one is Shumrudze. These orchids are very dear to the Usoakas. Uh, the Chicho is very common, and we, we can see it uh, right now in this season, uh, blooming everywhere. Shumrudzi is a very sweet smelling or orchid and uh, um, it is quite rare. Uh, I, I do not know. Uh, Chucho is a dendrobium species and Shumrudzi I do not know. Uh, we have not been able to uh, ascertain his, its uh, scientific name as yet. Uh, so once they become orchids, there is, there is further persecution. The, the sister-in-law tries to uh, kill those plants as well, uh, but then the orchids go and uh, wait on the path when the brother returns, and the brother sees the flowers and he says, um, "Oh, these are beautiful flowers, and I would like to uh, pluck them and give it to my uh, give them to my sister." Uh, then, as he is plucking, the sisters cry out, uh, "Brother, don't touch us! It, it, it hurts. Uh, we are your sisters." Um, and they narrate the whole story and the brother is very sad. He goes home um, and uh, he is heartbroken. And eventually he goes to the field and he sees that uh, the sisters are invisible, but they are doing all the field work for, his, uh, for their brother. They are sowing the seeds and they're helping out with the field work, but they are not visible. So he knows that the sisters are invisible and they're there. Um, so he tries to run around and try to trying to recognize uh, their footsteps and uh, try to catch them, but that is not possible. Then finally, the sisters say, "All right, we can't help you if you're trying to if you're mourning our loss all the time and trying to cling on to us. Um, now we are very different, so we will uh, go and dwell on the tree, and from there we will uh, help you." And from today onwards, we will indicate when you have to sow your seeds when your agricultural season begins. And uh, e even to this day in the village, people look at these orchids and when they are in bloom, they start their field work. Um, and, and that is the story in short. From the story, uh, we gather this, although it's a tragic story, humans are intimately related to natural ent uh, entities. Usuakas consider the tiger as their brother, orchid as their sister, and the hawk as their uncle. 
they watch over us, protect us, and sustain us. Um, from the two stories, we can gather these fundamental insights. Uh, first of all, there's a cosmic balance of dynamic interrelationality. Um, there is suffering, disease, and calamity when the balance is lost. The balance is restored only when every being gets its due and justice is restored. And mythology, for example, is a narrative web that holds all these meaning systems together. Mythologies encode people's sense of identity and they explain the place of everything in the universe. So I would like to revisit the question um, now, this why bother? We asked this question right in the beginning. I hope the answer is becoming clear now. Um, the whole system, meaning system and the worldview is an interrelated uh, web for any culture, whether it's an indigenous culture or any other culture. There, is, there are mythologies, oral history, worldview, rituals, rites of passage, customs, dress, uh, festival food, these are all connected uh, in, in a, one big interconnected whole. But language is at the center because language is the one which holds everything together. The words of a language are not merely words. Uh, they are meanings that a person has heard from childhood. They create, these words create pathways in, the, uh, in their brains. Uh, they connect emotionally uh, and each word speaks very powerfully. Uh, when, when, when you utter them in your mother tongue. But when the language is lost, there is this void in the center. And uh, without that strong uh, center, all these meaning uh, making systems cannot remain connected and the entire system will be wiped out slowly. Uh, the concepts will still remain, but they, they are still uh, they are just ghosts of their formal selves and they are no longer interconnected. This is the tragedy of language loss. Uh, so prevent this tragedy, what can, what can be done? What can we do? One way of uh, preventing language loss is uh, language documentation. I would like to discuss what we are doing among the Oso Akas uh, very briefly now. Um, again, I would um, emphasize that this has been a collaborative Usoaka language documentation. I thank all my team members, whoever, um, most of them are uh, listening today. It is because of you this has been possible and a big thanks to all of you. Uh, I have learned so much from you and uh, from the entire Usoaka community. Thank you. Uh, the, my, my association with the Usoaka community began in 1999, as Joey said at the beginning of this talk. Um, and language documentation uh, started in 2015. Uh, Peter Austin explains the five steps of language documentation as follows. There is first step is recording, and then we, uh, recording is obvious. Uh, either video or audio recording, then we transfer the recorded data into uh, our computers, and then we transcribe, translate, annotate, add metadata, etc. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all these details, but I will just briefly explain uh, in the next slides. Uh, then the material, entire data is archived so that native speaker community can access uh, this archived material and. Uh, uh, use, uh, use it for their own language purposes. Uh, finally, there is language description and community mobilization. Uh, I would like to uh, briefly dwell on all the uh, steps. First, types of recording. Uh, in Himmelman's uh, definition, we saw that it has to be multi-purpose and different samples of Usoaka language data. So we collected various samples, like sacred stories, word lists, uh, oral history, searching for wild tubers, uh, simply a group chatter when people are going to the jungle uh, to forage for food, a traditional dance, uh, a, a conversation on women's status, uh, another sacred dance. Uh, we also recorded a live meeting uh, when it was taking place in the village, uh, weaving and explanation of how weaving is done, a basket weaving uh, session, uh, simply an evening fireside chat, 
and archery competition and hunting and many more uh, genre of uh, recording. The, the point being, the recording has to be multi-purpose and uh, multi, uh, in, in involving multi-faceted uh, data. Of course, there is always this linguistic illustration. I would like to demonstrate some of the videos now. Ah, this is you can see two men uh, just weaving a basket, uh, jumping from one topic to the other. This is a very natural uh, sample of the language. This is a traditional dance. This is gathering wild tubers. Uh, you can see the lady digging out that huge uh, wild tuber. Hey. Which is hey. very hey. Quite hey. Hey. And returning from that uh, tradition room. Yeah, but stop, Mama. Just put your so we have some cool recordings now what the next step is uh next steps are like um transferring adding value and archiving that, that I just mentioned from Peter Austin's five steps. Uh, this is how the final product looks like after we transcribe. Um, we are also working on a Wasoaka dictionary. We have already have uh, we already have a corpus. Uh, I mean, three thousand five hundred words, and we uh, the word list is uh, growing by the day. And then we finally find the final step of language documentation. Uh, not not the final. The fourth step is archiving, and the data is archived at ELAR Endangered Languages Archive, uh, so as London. Then comes language description. Uh, I would like to just give one example. Uh, also has very uh, strange sounding uh, coronal consonants, consonantal complexity. And we undertook a study uh, of uh, palatography using this Ladifugate's method of uh, using charcoal to uh, paint people's mouth and uh, identifying the places of articulation and we found four places of articulation and that really immensely helped us in classifying these uh, and categorizing these sounds and that is analyzed into features how features are like how brain and vocal apparatus proce processes uh, sounds and then from there uh, we make this made this list and then finally it is distilled down to orthography the writing system. The next step is community mobilization. The first book in Osaka was in 1999. And from there we have come a long way. This was the first textbook in 2005. And 2012, uh, Nuzusa or Beautiful Songs and a mobile dictionary under development, but also uh, a smaller version has been released already. Uh, the leaders of Husso Elite Society, also Aka Elite Society, uh, have been very encouraging. And we published a storybook in 2018. And 
This is our so website uh, in a rudimentary form. We are planning to uh, strengthen it further. And this alphabet chart was released last year. And there are signs of hope for the language. We formed a Uso Aka literature team in 2017, and the team is working towards language promotion and language revitalization uh, and producing literature in the language, original literature. And these are our language warriors, uh, enthusiastic youngsters, and also elders who have been constant companions uh, in this work. So in conclusion, Indigenous languages encode ways of living in harmony with nature, which most of the world has already forgotten. For example, Uso see themselves as related, uh, related to the orchid, the tiger, the hawk, and other living beings, not in a metaphorical sense, but in a real sense. Their stories tell us about how they derive their identity from their land, their forests, and their relatedness to animals, birds, and plants. In their worldview, each being has its own realm and is in a give and take relationship with other beings. When such relationships are respected, there is harmony. When these are disturbed, there is suffering and chaos. And that worldview is encoded in their language. And when the language is destroyed, their entire worldview will crumble, and this will have devastating consequences for their meaning system. But I'd like to end on a note of hope. Through language documentation, through the community support, community involvement, uh, this language doc documentation empowers the native speaker community by preserving their language and thus preserving their identity and meaning systems. Thanks to all these people and many more. Uh, thanks to uh, ELDP and all these people and organizations that supported me. Uh, these are some of the references. Finally, thank you for your patient listening. Great, thank you so much, BJ. I'm sure we didn't have to be patient. It was all really interesting and great to just get a, some insight into to the work you've been doing that the community's been doing and uh, really a, a good picture of the language grounded in what's actually happening in the society and, and the culture and the atmosphere as well. Uh, we've got a few uh, questions and so feel free to add your questions to the chat. We've got about 10 minutes to uh, see if we can get BJ to talk a little bit more about whatever you're interested in hearing about. The first questions were really about more the question about the relationship between identity and society. So one question was, if language and identity are somehow linked, uh, shouldn't language evolve with the identity? So maybe if I can elaborate on that question, if you, so you had your um, chart of showing, you know, what happens when the local language disappears and the hole it leaves, couldn't say Hindi evolve to fill that hole and be used in that function in that society, um, yeah, so maybe you can elaborate, could you elaborate a bit more about your, what you're thinking of in terms of this relationship between language and identity and how that changes and evolves over time? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for this question. Um, one thing I must say at the outset is uh, I'm not recommending any exclusivistic, uh, uh, you know, any ideology here. I'm not saying people should not learn any other language, uh, only their local native uh, languages. No, that's, that's not the idea. Um, what's important is they are rooted in their own language and that helps people to root uh, themselves in their own identities. Uh, I think during the presentation, I've uh, connected identities, uh, language and identity in the sense that why your own uh, heritage language is important because there are concepts and words that are not present in other languages. So let's take the example of Hindi, for example, uh, Hindi. Uh, Hindi is the mainland Indian language, North Indian language, and learn it by all means, no problem. But when you give up your mother tongue and 
you learn Hindi and replace your mother tongue with it, um, you're not replace, you're not familiar with the concepts and the worldview and the roots of that language. So, so the native Hindi speakers from UP or Bihar have centuries old advantage over uh, over you in that sense. So you're not perfect there and you're not perfect in your own language because you have given up your own uh, native language. So this is the whole uh, dynamic that, uh, that goes on uh, there. Of course, um, being a speaker of Hindi, you can evolve your own identity eventually, but that will take generations. It will take three or four generations, uh, but you'll have to begin with the a generation which has lost its own root. And that is always a very traumatic process. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, there's one, one other question that's along the same lines, um, maybe a bit of a, a philosophical one. I'll just read the statement here. I believe that language is part of identity, not the other way around. But what's your proof that identity is part of language? Again, I think just pushing more in this this concept of how we view identity and language. Is language a part of identity or identity part of language? Or does that not make any sense to have that discussion in that way at all? Do you have any response to that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to respond to it because it's a, it's a chicken and egg question, actually. Um, again, identities evolve over time. Um, I, I had a nice story about... Uh, uh, a current, uh, uh, you know, evolving myth about Tage Raja, but I ran out of time. Uh, so I wanted to discuss this question actually. Um, well, you've got five story, minutes, but, so give us your five minute uh, overview of that that question. Uh, I, I think I think I need more than that. So <laughs> okay. maybe, uh, yeah, I, I I would say that I mean one one fulfills the one. Uh, I can't even say depends on the other. Uh, it, they are definitely interrelated. So, but, but there is no clear cut distinction on which is, you know, which I, I wouldn't like to make that distinction. I mean, perhaps part of the question was the, the issue of contrast you brought up and that if you do, even if you can say evolve to express certain concepts in another language, then you lose the sense of contrast with those who, who don't have that language. But anyway, I'm sure it's a much more complex yeah, yeah, yeah. issue. Uh, let me ask one more question that just popped up here. Um, uh, I'll just read the question. There is a greater in-depth spiritual cultural identity that our mother tongue holds. Therefore, I ask if one individual does not speak his or her language and does not know his or her culture anymore, rather they are westernized, then do we consider them truly of that ethnicity? Um, so as things change over generation, so in my own example, my great great grandparents were Norwegian. I don't know the language or culture anymore because they immigrated. So am I still? Do I still have that ethnicity? Or, or is it a black and white question? Or yeah, how does that, what happens? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say that's. I mean, uh, I was talking specifically about indigenous communities. There's a difference between people who migrate out of their own choice to another culture and then they sort of make their culture their own. That is a completely a different process altogether. Um, and I specifically concentrated on indigenous languages and communities. And in this context, what happens is there's an invasion of another language into, into their own area. There is, is not people out of their free will moving uh, onto a different area, and I wouldn't li wouldn't like to uh, go into that question at all because that's not my, my area of ex expertise, and I have not observed that phenomenon uh, closely. Uh, but this is a question of dominant language invasion uh, through various means and methods. Uh, people being pressurized to give up their own uh, language. So I am specifically focusing on that uh, situation here. Yeah, so there's definitely, yeah, power dynamics have to be considered in, in different contexts. Yeah, too. definitely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, we'll go with these last two questions. Uh, so one question is, uh, what kinds of challenges did you face while working with the uh, Hurusoka? And um, yeah, did you discover something through those challenges that changed your perspective on language documentation and language endangerment? 
Um, yeah, so go ahead and answer that question and then I have one final one for you after that. Yeah, I, I just saw that question, I think is from uh, Meenakshi Singh uh, about uh, changing my, you know, yeah. whether my field work experience changed my perspective. Yeah, uh, definitely. So I'd like to recall one particular experience that I had. Um, I was, when I went there, I uh, had already worked with the Uso community for about 17 years. So I thought I, uh, I, I know the culture quite well by then. And I was uh, practically, I was the sort of expert there uh, deciding on what to record because I had this, you know, linguist perspective and I was recording certain things. Then suddenly an idea came to me, why not show these recording to people, uh, record various recordings to people and get their feedback. And that was a shocking experience for me because um, before asking them, I identified four of my favorite recordings. And uh, I showed about 20 recordings to them, asked them to grade uh, those recordings. And one, only one of my favorite re recording was chosen as their favorite. Uh, three of them were, were completely different. So that shocked me because I, I realized that I need a sort of change of course here. Uh, and uh, then, so that was a turning point in my documentation. Then. Uh, we started uh, discussing more about what uh, we could record and also I started more training uh, native speaker collaborators more and more so that they can bring their perspective inside and they have corrected me many times uh, when I said this is important they would have they have told me no 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 not this this, this is the most important thing here so I've been uh, yeah this is one of the most important experiences that I had uh, I, I would say Okay, and the last question I'll ask is, um, can you share with us what the community's next steps are for working with the language? Are they still doing documentation? Is there literacy? Are there other creative linguistic activities they're working on? Yeah, um, Akhaeli Society has given us a mandate uh, to produce literature and we are, um, we are not only uh, documenting the language, uh, we, we will continue to document the language because now there are lots of my collaborators are trained in this. so. Uh, this is the best time they are sensitive to what is important what is not important in the language so uh, they will carry on that work uh, but at the same time we are we are going to produce original literature we have already composed a couple of poems um, and uh, we are in the process of making uh, about five textbooks uh, in the coming three years or so um, so this work will go on the next year i think uh, we, have, uh, we we have a plan to um, introduce the language as a subject in the schools uh, next, by next year. Uh, these are small steps, but uh, you know that's the plan. Great. Uh, so we'll we'll end there. I'll just make a few comments before ending this meeting. Uh, a couple people have asked if uh, this is going to be available online. Uh, we're not planning to make this talk uh, available online, so you probably won't find it anywhere. Um, but if people do want to follow up, VJ, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you if they have more questions or want to share material or follow up with you? Perhaps email would be uh, the best way. Uh, Which one are you willing to share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, uh, this is, uh, hey, do you have that one? Uh, you can tell me, I'll type it into the chat. Yeah, yeah D-S-O-U. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. Uh, Z A D S O U Z A V dot A C yeah at gmail.com the Sousa V dot A C at gmail.com yeah that's right yes okay and I think uh, also on Twitter at VJ Linguist people want to keep the conversation going there as well thank you so much for your time for being willing to share with us I wish you the Best of luck with your submission coming up as well and your planned return to the community this year. We hope that goes well. I'm sure lots of people are excited to see you uh, in India again. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for everyone coming out to participate and hanging out with us for this hour. Really encouraging and I hope this has been inspiring and encouraging for you and whatever kinds of linguistics you're doing uh, or whatever you're doing with language in your life uh, outside of the academic world. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you again, VJ. Thanks. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, everyone. All right, goodbye everyone, thank you. Bye-bye.